My guinea pig. Welcome. Thank you all for coming to our Meet the School Board Candidates Forum. Uh, my name is Annette McCarty Abraham, and I'm a parent at Liberty High School, and I'm also president of the Peoria United Parent Council. And we are hosting this event in, in conjunction with some friends, and I'll introduce them in a moment. Um, the, the Peoria, if you're unfamiliar, the Peoria United Parent Council is a district-wide parent group. So like you would have at your own elementary or high school, a parent booster club, PTA, PTO, were the district-wide version of that. Um, the, the reason we're organized is just to give parents an opportunity to have their voice in some of these district-wide decisions that impact our students. Uh, we are hosting tonight's forum with the League of Women Voters of Northwest Maricopa County, and they're a nonpartisan group, and we're very thankful for their assistance. Part of what uh, they were, and I, if you did not get the opportunity, there are index cards at the entryway. If you do have individual questions, uh, you can pick up a card, and we'll be collecting those on the side here. I think I saw a lot of people grabbing cards. To not, uh, I think you're going to review the format. Okay, thanks, Liz. Our, our moderator for this evening will be Lois Breckner, and I will let her give a little overview of her role. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you for inviting the League and for holding this forum. I think it should be very good for everyone, and I gather it will be shown throughout the district, um, televised, et cetera. So I do hope people take advantage of that. Um, the League of Women Voters is nonpartisan. We never support a candidate in an election. We do study issues, and we do lobby for issues we believe in. But in terms of candidates, we try to be totally nonpartisan. Um, we're going to start this, whoops, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we're, we're going to start with a minute and a half each for each of the uh, people running for the governing board. And uh, we ask that you adhere to that 90 second rule because there's so many questions people want to be able to ask. Uh, everyone will have a chance to respond to questions. We will keep moving around so a different person starts the answer um, each time. But we're going to start alphabetically to begin with. Uh, you know, I just expect everyone, you can disagree but be agreeable. <laughs> okay. And then we'll all do very well. Uh, you know, the beginning. 90 seconds that you have, uh, what they're looking for is what in your background leads you to believe that you would be an effective school board member. And we're going to start with Dr. Michael Gard. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm Michael Gard. I am a parent first. I have a seven-year-old. She goes to Peoria Traditional School in second grade. I also have a 17-month-old that will be going into you know, the Peoria schools when she gets older. Um, in addition to being a parent, I am an educator. I've been in education for 13 years. I spent seven years in the classroom as a classroom teacher. I was a science teacher and a CTE engineering teacher during those seven years before I became an administrator. When I became an administrator, I was a dean of students, assistant principal of instruction, and most currently the assistant principal of registration at an inner city Phoenix high school here. Um, in addition to that, I have also been the negotiation chairs for the administration association within Phoenix Union. Um, so I've served on that negotiation teams and understand what it takes to negotiate, you know, contracts, um, other, uh, you know, other negotiated items within a district. I understand the inner workings of a school district through that negotiations process. I understand school finance and budgets and what it takes to understand a salary package, what it takes to understand benefits, what it takes when you're talking about hiring teachers, when you're talking about surplusing teachers. I understand all that background by sitting on the negotiations teams. In addition to that, um, I have also earned my master's and doctorate from Arizona State University. 
Um, my master's is in educational leadership and supervision, as well as my doctorate's in educational leadership and supervision. So I think uh, with my parent background, my education background, my, my education as in post-secondary education, going above and beyond, um, it kind of well rounds me to have a great understanding of what it takes to be a school board member, um, not only as a parent, as a community member, but also as an educator and with that background. Our next speaker will be Beverly Pingarelli. Thank you. I would like to thank PUPC for organizing this candidate forum. Over the past four years, it has been a great honor to serve as a governing board member, and I am hopeful our community will entrust me to serve another term. So what qualifies me to be a governing board member for our school district? I guess I should say if I wasn't qualified four years ago, I've come a long way to get here today, to, to, excuse me, to, to, today. I have been and still am a bit anxious when it comes to public speaking, but I have learned a lot and can continue to grow. For me, important characteristics and qualifications for a governing board member includes one's temperament, second is the ability to demonstrate leadership by conviction, and third is to make decisions based on what the data is telling us. All of my votes focus on one guiding principle. Will my actions result in improved student academic achievement? I have lived in the district for 15 years and just celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary with my husband, Dr. Peter Pingarelli. We have raised two daughters that graduated from Centennial High School. I work full-time at Grand Canyon University setting up undergraduate laboratories. I also work part-time at St. Joseph's Hospital in the Molecular Medicine Laboratory, utilizing my skills in gene expression analysis, infectious disease testing, and cytogenetics. Uh, I'm Beverly Pingarelli, and I look forward to this discussion. All right, Davita Salter. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you, everybody, for coming. And I'd like to also thank the people who sent me messages today. Um, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the League of Women Voters, along with the Parent United Parent Council. I am Davita Salter. I worked in the school district for 31 years. I not only worked at the elementary school, but I also worked at the high school. I was a teacher and also an assistant principal and a principal at both the elementary and the high school. After I retired in 2012, I went over to Glendale Elementary School District, which is similar to very several of our schools in our district, and I became a classified employee. And so there, I was a family educator at Melvin E. Science School, and I'm currently the wellness program specialist for the entire school district, which puts me in the Department of Human Resources. So because of that, I feel that I have um, a great deal of background knowing all areas of the school district. I also have lived in the school district, and I am only, the only candidate up here who lives in the city of Glendale and has been very active in the city of Glendale. I am the, on the uh, personnel board for the city, and I am the chairperson for that, along with being very active in the Historical Society and Glendale Ambassadors. So with that, I feel like I have a great deal of experience to pass along to everybody, and I have passion for service and passion for education. And so what better way to serve than to be a governing board member? Thank you. Corey Underhill. All right. Yes, I want to also repeat that and thank everybody for coming out tonight, especially in the rain. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I have several different types of experience that would lend themselves well to being a board member for Peoria. Um, first of all, I've most recently been a teacher for the past four years. I've been teaching um, as a third grade teacher at Frontier and Oakwood prior to that. And I really feel like that experience, especially over the last four years when we've had some significant transition, have really helped me kind of develop an in-the-trenches perspective of how our state and our district policy policies and our strategies and our decisions really impact cl the classroom and students every single day. Um, I also feel like I have a good connection to my colleagues and an understanding of what their needs and their challenges are. Um, prior to returning to teaching, which was my first career and I kind of had a, a middle thing going on, um, I worked in the nonprofit sector for a number of years. Um, after getting a master's degree in nonprofit management, I worked as a grant writer for several um, health and human service organizations through a nonprofit consulting agency. Um, we developed many, many, many successful foundation and government grants, um, including multi million dollar projects um, and federal grants, such as a 21st century community learning program that we did with Denver Public Schools schools, the mayor's office, and several other partners. Um, I also worked as a program director in an alternative setting for youth, um, serving kids that were involved in the juvenile system as well as teen parents. 
Um, and then my husband and I moved to Iowa. <laughs> and while I was there, I worked in a program called Gear Up, which focuses on helping middle school, um, low-income children and their families to start thinking about college early. Um, I just feel like the wealth of experiences that I've had as both a, a teacher and a parent, um, especially as a parent, really allow me to bring a lot to PUSD. And I'm grateful the ex for the experience that my family and my sons have had in this district. Thank you. We have a lot of very good questions. And we're going to start with um, Ms. Pingarelli uh, to begin with. Uh, this is, I think, a, a, an excellent question. What do you see as the educational gaps or weaknesses and the educational strengths in our district? Ms. Pingarelli? OK. Um, educational gaps, uh, I would say it is um, for Peoria, uh, we have a, a, a strong turnover um, of, of teachers or a, a higher turnover of teachers. Um, the governing board for the last four years has tried to, um, tried to keep uh, the teachers, um, tried to help with autonomy, tried to um, uh, give teachers a little bit uh, I guess, a reason to stay in Peoria. Um, uh, and, and one of the good things is the teachers uh, that we try so hard to, to keep here. Thank you. You took my yes, answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I, too, believe that our, um, our weaknesses are is ret its retention and uh, making sure that we have the right teachers in the classroom. We have some issues now because of the way certification has come about that we're dealing with behavior issues and professionalism in, in our classrooms because of we're dealing with individuals who have not taught before or who have not gone through um, any educational system. And so that is bringing um, some weak, not weaknesses, but there are some weaknesses for those individuals and because of that, that's putting a strain on our administrators and their fellow teachers. And, be, and, there, and therefore, there are individuals who are having to do different jobs that they weren't expecting to do. Our strength is definitely our support for our teachers. Uh, I hear constantly about how teachers feel valued, how um, we have the professional development program with the modified Mondays, that is definitely a strength that we can continue to help our teachers, um, not only who are experienced, but also those who are new. So those are the two things, strength, or retention and support. Thank you. And um, the final one is um, Ms. Underhill. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll go back to Michael. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think one of the, the gaps that I noticed as a teacher recently is that we've had a lot of changes. I just came back to teaching four years ago, um, and there have been significant changes in the district um, as well, you know, through leadership changes as well as curricular directions. And a lot of, when we come back in the summertime, sometimes it feels like there's a fire hose shooting at us with all the different things that we're um, required to do. So I feel like that combined with the challenges at the state level and resources is, is just caused some, some challenging in t challenges in teaching in general and that we've become somewhat fragmented. I feel like we really need to kind of circle our wagons and um, identify what best practices are working in our district and leverage those best practices and those resources. Um, as far as strength, I mean, Peoria is awesome. Peoria is what has helped make Peoria the number one city to live in Arizona um, and that brand continues but we have to do the best that we can to keep it strong we have higher than average um, AZ merit scores although we have tremendous gaps between schools we have higher than average SAT and ACT scores and a great graduation rate so we have a lot to brag about but we got to keep it strong thank you and dr. Gard I almost forgot you <laughs> <laughs> um, I would agree with what everyone's already said about retention and uh, you know, teacher satisfaction in the district I think those are all things that need to be examined um, just because, you know, we've got a problem, and I know it working in Phoenix Union, how many teachers that I get from, you know, the, the trend seems to be teachers are going Peoria, Tallis, and Phoenix Union. It's just this cyclical motion, and then when they get, they want to work back by home again, that's when they're going back to Peoria. And unfortunately, that shouldn't be happening. Our teachers should be staying home. They should be staying in Peoria. Um, and where they begin their careers, we shouldn't see the, the jumping around that's occurring in the district. And so I think addressing that. 
But uh, going beyond that, I think uh, a gap and a strength of the district is also the educational programs that we offer within the district. Um, we offer many educational programs, K through 12, um, but sometimes those are isolated by region. Um, and not every student always has an opportunity to access all those programs. So I think that's a strength and a weakness is the fact that we offer these great programs, but sometimes the students that you know, might thrive in these programs might not always have access and accountability or ability to access those programs and be, you know, enter those programs and be involved in those programs to have the success um, that they would truly have if they had the opportunities to enter those programs. So I think it's twofold there with the, uh, the programs in the district being a strength and a weakness to look at also. All right, thank you. Um, the next question will start with Davida Salter. And if you could change one thing about the way we educate children, what would it be? One thing. We could change one thing. I would say that um, we need to make sure that every student is given an opportunity to work at their strengths. Uh, sometimes we place students in classrooms and they're unable to function because there may be a behavior issue. Uh, the, the classroom might be too large. We may not have the skills to enrich that child. So I think if, we, if I had one thing that we could change, if we could have smaller class sizes, if we could have um, teachers who were certified in every classroom so that those individual students would get what they needed, then I would say that would be the one thing that I could, I could change. Thank you, Ms. Underhill. Okay. Um, I think one thing from my standpoint as a teacher and as a parent would be fewer and more meaningful assessments. I feel like we are continuously assessing our kids and changing the way that we assess them and trying to figure out, and I know we have to be accountable and we need ways to assess our progress and our students, but with such an emphasis on that, a lot of the children are starting to not be as engaged um, with those assessments. And we've had this conversation at home with my older, my, I have a junior and an eighth grader, and you know, when it comes down to Arizona Merit, they're being tested on so many other things that we really have to, and we do, we emphasize and we incentivize that at home. But it would be great if we could figure out more meaningful and fewer assessments. And of course, if we could invest in our kids, that'd be great too. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gard. I'm gonna piggyback on what uh, Ms. Underhill just said is, assessments I think are currently is a, Overassessment in our public schools is becoming a big problem. My second grader that goes pure traditional is already stressed about the third grade AZ Merit. Mm -hmm. I mean, in second grade, you know, just the fact that she even knows about AZ Merit is one thing. To already being concerned about having to pass AZ Merit is another thing. And that's just, for a second grader to be worrying about a standardized test in second grade as a seven-year-old just seems wrong. And we're doing that throughout their educational career. It's not just something that's ending in elementary and, and something else is changing in high school. Currently, I mean, we're seeing AZ Merit across the board. We're seeing these excessive amount of testing days with the current AZ Merit platform that chews up time, you know, special classroom time that these teachers need in the spring semesters are spent testing. You know, like the kids are sitting in front of computers, you know, expected to answer questions, answer these tests. You know, and a lot of times these formats are something the students have never seen. And the state has yet to develop a proper uh, testing format so that teachers can prepare the students and have them ready for these tests. You know, these students go in oftentimes blind to the format with very little preparation and are expected to excel and achieve on these tests. Now, Peoria is getting great success on some of these exams, but how much of that classroom time could be better spent in other locations and preparing students for the true content of the classroom, the true expectations of the classrooms, the standards that should be taught in the classroom and not getting ready for a standardized assessment. Yes, Ms. Bingarelli. Oh, yes, I would say um, uh, something as simple as getting back to basics. Um, I uh, got on the governing board because I've seen science and math scores um, declining. Um, since I've been here, we um, uh, have gotten rid of environmental science, and we're going back to the basics of biology, chemistry, uh, physics. Um, and, the, and also to, uh, to start... Uh, trying to bring in even higher qualified math, science, and special ed um, teachers um, just to try to get uh, the scores up. Our AIMS science scores, uh, the last time we looked is, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to think. 
Uh, AIM science was 41% passing, 59% uh, um, that did not meet expectation. Um, and uh, um, English language arts uh, was 25% passing. So mm -hmm. trying to get back to the basics and um, doing that well. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, since this question is for Corey Underhill starting, mm -hmm. um, there was one directed at you, and certainly the rest of you could respond as oh. well. Uh, <laughs> they want to know why having a teacher's voice on the board is important. I guess I just think that there's, there's so many things that happen at a policy level that directly impact teachers in the classroom and impact students every day. And it, I think it's just really hard to kind of understand what's going on when you're not in the classroom every single day. I used to sit on boards and coalitions. In fact, that's why I went back into teaching because I felt like I just didn't have that boots on the ground perspective anymore. And now that I've been back there, it's just, it's so different when you're in the classroom and you're dealing with behaviors and, and issues and, you know, trying to figure out what curriculum works to, to make a new, when you come down and you've got a new policy that they want to put into place, it just doesn't fit. So I just feel like having that teacher perspective back on the board and not just a teacher on the board, but having additional teacher voice throughout the decisions that we make in different ways to engage is super, super critical. Thank you. Doctor, do you wish to comment? Yeah, I think having an educator's voice on the board is important. Um, as being a previous classroom teacher and now an administrator, I understand what, you know, what is expected in the classroom. I understand um, what the teachers are struggling with on a, on a campus. I understand what administrators are struggling with on the campus. And I think having that, un that understanding and sitting on the board gives you a whole new perspective of what's important or what will make an impact. What decisions the board will make will make a direct impact to not only the educators, the administrators, but the students in the classroom. Because if the board decisions are making an impact to the schools and to the educators, that means it's making a direct impact to the students in the classroom. And that's the most important thing that we can't lose sight of, is that every decision we make needs to impact those students for the positive and not harm a student in any way. So having an educator there who's gone through those roles, who has that experience, who understands what a decision that is being made by a board, could, how it could impact the classroom, how it could impact the schools, is very important. So I think that's why it's important to have you know, educators on the board having that background. Ms. Pingarelli? Uh, yes, I would definitely like to answer this. Um, I am the only non-educator uh, of, of uh, all four of us on the board. Um, and I believe that uh, the board represents the community. Um, the entire board, if it were all teacher or admin centric, that does not represent the community. Um, uh, the board is responsible for hiring or firing a superintendent to set policy and for budgets. I don't think you have to have a teacher uh, background in order to do those things. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Salter. I think it would be very important to have a educator's voice on the board. Uh, we, we have a, an educator now, and I think it would help with some of the decisions that are made. Sometimes the learning curve does not have to be as high. And those educators can not only educate the public, but can also educate the individuals who are on the board. And so that voice is definitely wanted and needed. I also think that um, sometimes things are done uh, by board members because they don't understand education. They haven't been in education. And a story was told to me a very long time ago when I was at Ironwood High School as an assistant principal. We were looking for people to run as board members and a gentleman was our uh, softball coach. It was uh, Joner Serretta and many of you know he owns Serretta's Candy Factory. He was very active at our school and I said, Joner, why don't you run? You would be a great advocate for education. And he said, Davida, me running for the board would be like you running the, coming in and telling me how to run the candy factory. And so sometimes we need to have our own voice heard so that we can educate other people about what education is all about. Thank you. All right, on to our next question. And this will start with Dr. Gard. Do you support the Peoria Unified School District's bond? If so, what actions have you taken to show that support? If no, why? Um, 
Yeah, I support the, uh, the bond. Um, I've endorsed it from the beginning. Um, I began sitting on, at those committee meetings in the spring of last year and uh, um, indirectly and directly voicing my opinion at some of those committee mean, meetings. Um, I have seen that I, through those committee meetings, I saw the bond take many shapes and forms. Um, and I think the bond that has come out to the community is a great bond that has a great potential to uh, service every student in the district in some form. Um, there are some feelings out there that other students and it's split. But if you look at the breakdown of the current bond, every school in the district is going to receive funding out of this bond, as well as addressing the growth potential of part of Peoria that is going to need additional schools in the coming years. Um, so I have, I've, from the beginning, I've supported this bond. I've endorsed the bond. I've been vocal about the bond measure. Um, I've been out there. I've been participating in any way um, in even canvassing for the bond instead of my own campaign to make sure the bond passes. Because I think, first and foremost, the bond is going to make the impact on our students more than I would as a board member almost. Because that money um, is going to make a huge impact for Peoria. We can't continue going in Peoria without that bond passing. Um, if we push that bond off another year or two, Peoria is going to see some major struggles that they're not going to be able to overcome without that bond passing. That bond passing is essential for the continued growth of Peoria and help stave off the attack from the charter schools that is currently going on in the local communities. So I think it's important to continue endorsing that bond and getting the message out there that the bond is one of the most important things on this year's <coughs> ballot and get it passed by our entire community. Thank you. Ms. Pingarelli? Uh, yes. Um, well, I was one of the five board members that uh, uh, voted to send the bond out to the community. Um, there was a little bit of a, uh, an issue with um, uh, the committee recommended the $149 million. Um, administration recommended $40 million for a high school in the north. Um, the, uh, the board recommended for the excuse me, $189 million to go out. Um, uh, I have been out there and talking to all the legislative districts, uh, Legislative District 20, 21, and 22, about the bond. Um, one thing that when I did uh, vote yes for the bond is I ask for uh, administration to look at the out-of-district students uh, in the north because right now Sunrise Mountain and Liberty High School are over capacity uh, and it, they're over capacity because we are accepting out-of-district students. Thank you. Um, yes, Ms. Selter. Yes, I am in support of the bond. I was here the night that the board thankfully uh, passed the vote five to zero to go out for a bond. I appreciated the administration coming forward and asking for more money so that there could be um, a high school built in the northern part of the district. But I also appreciated that the bond committee looked at every school in this district and noticed that there were issues that needed to be um, dealt with, whether that was for facilities or whether it was for equipment. But every school will be impacted by this bond, and we need to make sure that that is the message that is sent out to everybody who hears about it. I have been on Facebook with the bond. I have been taking signs out, delivering them to individual people's homes. Um, I have handed out papers about the bond, the palm uh, cards about the bond. I endorsed the bond. And finally, this past uh, weekend, I had the opportunity to be with the class of 88 at Peoria High School. And at that time, I was even able to hand them the cards um, and let them know that what they saw now um, and how life has changed in 30 years from them, uh, that the wonderful education that they received, they needed to support those students who are coming after them. Thank you. Ms. Underhill. Um, yes, so yes, I absolutely 100% support the bond. Um, I endorse the bond, my husband endorsed the bond, um, and we've been doing everything that we can to continue participating in events and that kind of thing. Um, personally, I'm going out every day to a school or two if I can get there on Modified Monday, <laughs> and handing out um, the bond palm cards to every single parent, every window I knock on, every car that's sitting in the car pickup line, because I just really want parents to understand that, you know, it's kind of like when you have a family and maybe you live in this house and you decide, we're getting too big for this house, we need to build on an addition. Well, you can't build the addition on and then forget about your foundation and your bathrooms and your plumbing and your air conditioning, right? I mean, we got to keep this family together and we got to keep it all nice for all of us. So I feel like the bond really, really does that. 
and I'll do whatever I can to make sure that that happens. So please consider passing this bond. Thank you. That was certainly unanimous. Uh, you know, our next question will start with Ms. Pingarelli, and um, it has to do with the standards um, in teaching biology that um, have been supported by our uh, superintendent of education, and they, the questioner wants to know how you feel about it, what's your opinion of these changes, and what you feel should be done. Well, thank you. Um, I have uh, heard uh, nothing but bad things about the standards um, for biology. Um, uh, I have not been involved in it. Um, I'm just I'm, I'm listening to other people who have science backgrounds. Um, I don't want to get uh, from bad to worse. Um, I haven't had an input on it, but um, uh, I would hope that uh, they would not go out as they stand right now. Thank you. Ms. Salter? Yes. The, um, I do not agree with the changes that have been um, asked to be implemented. I do not believe that um, creationism should be taught in our schools. I don't believe that we should bring in uh, religious backgrounds into our schools. Uh, we should teach biology principles, and uh, we should hear from our teachers who are teaching that subject and making sure that those are the principles that we are teaching every single day. And we need to make sure that if we're going to rewrite standards, that we have teachers involved at the State Department of Education te um, writing those standards and having input in those standards. Thank you. Ms. Underhill. I would echo what Davida said completely. Um, and, you know, I'm a Christian woman, but I don't believe that creationism has a place in our, our, school, our public school district curriculum. I feel like scientific discovery has shown and proven plenty um, that we can teach to our students, and I'm by no means an expert on science, but I don't feel like that's the right direction. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start with Ms. Salter. What? Don't get the answer. Oh, <laughs> I did it again. It's like she sits at the end there, and it's like, it's, okay. as a As a past science teacher myself, my degree is actually in biology, and I, I agree with everyone's comments here, is that um, creationism doesn't belong currently in our classrooms. Um, I know there's a big push by, by her, I guess her group, of, to look at bringing creationism in the classroom. The next gen science standards were just adopted in the last couple of years, and that covers all of our science standards that are looking at. Um, and so why would we go and start making adjustments after we've just looked at the next gen science standards and adjusting those and putting those into our classrooms and making major changes? Another way she's trying to get around that is that new liberal arts college standards that she's trying to push across the board. Because if you look at the background of those standards, it also includes creationism because she knows that just addressing biology alone, it might not pass. So she's trying to find loopholes to get this through in the next two and a half months while she's still in office. Um, but I, I, you know, I hope and I hope most of you in the room believe that if she were to push something through in the next two months, that in January we see a, a new elected official that um, makes adjustments and, and gets us back on track with um, our, our next gen science standards and what the true focus is in, what our, in our students' classrooms. Thank you. At least I was right that it was un <laughs> unanimous. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, we're going to start now with. Um, all right. Uh, yes. What? Davida. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very good. And this is a heck of a question. Okay. All right. What does supporting teachers look like to you? Okay. So, having worked in the school system for 31 years and having been an administrator for 25 of those years, no, 24 of those years, I would say supporting teachers means listening. That's, the, that's a definite key, because often um, you may have a perspective on a teacher, but don't know the entire picture about what's going on. So listening is definitely a big key to supporting teachers. Supporting teachers also means being in the classrooms and watching what's going on and seeing what individual students are doing in their classrooms, whether that's for the positive or for the negative. It also means sitting down with teachers and sharing viewpoints and making sure they understand where you're coming from as well. And then supporting 
also means being at events. It means um, talking out in the public about education and what it's truly like these days because even in the six years I've been away from Peoria Unified, it's totally different. It also means making sure that um, I'm able to educate the public about what education is all about and that is my biggest strength I feel that I would be able to do that for all of our teachers and not only our teachers but our staff members too because they are just as important as the teachers in the classroom. Thank you, Ms. Underhill. Great. Um, well, I think as we've seen over the last year that a big, huge piece of support is compensation. So, <laughs> as you know, everybody, we don't want to talk about it, but obviously whatever we can do to make sure that our teachers are fairly and well compensated and have good benefits and all those kinds of things are just critical because the job has a lot of intangible benefits, but when it comes down to it, people have to make a living, a livable wage. Um, a second thing that I think is supporting teachers is just the working conditions. Are we respecting their time? Are we respecting Respecting their prep? Are our duties reasonable? Um, are we providing support for the behaviors in the classroom that are challenging so that we're not, you know, losing time, teaching time for other students? Um, is there genuine policy or engagement for teachers? Are there genuine opportunities for teachers to actually engage in policy and decisions around curriculum and resources and those kinds of things? And then last of all, I think it's really about community support and respect and building that for teachers. Um, respect is a big deal, and we have lots and lots of organizations in our communities that are willing to help our schools and want to help our teachers. So I think one thing that we can really do is work to develop those partnerships because we can't do it all on our own. Um, there's one organization called School Connect that I was recently um, introduced to that really has simplified that and, and kind of they can come in and map all the resources that you have available to you in your community. And those organizations are really interested to help support our teachers, and by supporting our teachers, we're supporting our students. So whatever we can do to support our students, we need to remember compensation, working conditions, and respect. Thank you. Dr. Gard. Um, I would say that uh, supporting our teachers, like uh, Ms. Underhill mentioned, it does come down to compensation, but I think many of our teachers would forego some of the compensation they received if they could just have classroom resources that they need in the classroom. You know, the supplies, the materials, what they need to make sure their students are successful. You know, if you hold, listen to the whole Red Fred movement, it wasn't just about salaries. It was about the overall funding for public education. And I think that's what the teachers need is the support overall, not just directly for salaries. Salaries is a great thing, and they all appreciate salary compensation. But I think it's supporting them for the resources they need in the classroom, the supplies they need in the classroom. You know, everything that they need in the classroom from us that we're providing them, it might come down to pencils and pens or markers. Mm -hmm. We all get those supply lists every year that we, we fill our teachers' classrooms with. You know, that, some of that is because our, our school districts can't provide those supports and those supplies that those teachers need in the classroom every day. Um, as well as, you know, just being there as a leader, you know, to support them with their professional growth, their professional development, making sure they are growing. Growing as an individual, growing as an educator. Every impact you make to a teacher is going to impact your students in the classroom. If you can positively impact the teachers, as, like me, myself as an administrator, the impact I do directly every day is to our teachers. But knowing that I directly impact our teachers and make it positive for them means that I'm making a positive impact to the 30 or 150 students that they impact in their classroom, depending if they're a K-8 or a K-12 teacher. So the more positive interactions we can have for our educators means more positive interactions that we have for our students in the classroom. Thank you, Ms. Pingarelli. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, supporting our teachers, if we're not able to give um, the salary, uh, to increase the salary, um, what I think the teachers would be happy with is autonomy in the classroom. Um, I think the teachers uh, need to take the curriculum and to teach it how they feel appropriate. Uh, as a teacher grows in their, their career, they will, their teaching style will, will change. Um, my favorite teacher was my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Phelps. Uh, she was very hands-on. We all went to Upwards Farms and got eggs, we hatched and had two chickens in, the, in, the, in our, our fourth grade classroom. Um, I mean, all of those things, uh, a child, rec you know, um, uh, they will keep with them for life. Uh, Mrs. Phelps took a very shy, introverted person, and I had just a wonderful time in her classroom. But to give the teachers um, autonomy and uh, let them teach as, as they, you know, let them be innovative and don't put uh, the curriculum, don't put them in a box and throw away the key. 
Thank you. Uh, the next question will start with Ms. Underhill. Mm -hmm. And it is, as a board member, uh, what, is, what is your vision to increase community outreach and resources? Okay. Um, well, I think, first of all, that Peoria does a pretty good job with the opportunities for people to be involved through their community advisory committees. Um, I think that is something that we need to continue to work on and always have those opportunities at key decision points around um, policy um, to have our communities involved. Um, I think another way that we could improve that or en enhance that would be to have more involvement, um, youth involvement opportunities. I know the city of Peoria has done a great job in developing a youth council, and I think it'd be neat for us to have a few more opportunities for students or a lot more opportunities for students to be directly involved and engaged in the things that impact them every day. Um, like I said before, I think we have great opportunity to reach out to the community organizations around us. Um, as a former grant writer, I know that those partnerships that we have in place are critical. It's not something you want to throw together when the grant RFP hits the street. <laughs> so we need to build those partnerships and really work and do whatever that we can because there's a lot of opportunities from state, foundation, federal, um, like learning grants that we can focus on and, and really build those partnerships to make sure that that happens for our district. Thank you. Dr. Gard. Um, I think it's important to go out there and, and develop those partnerships and identify those partnerships and having some individuals in place at the district and campus levels that are, are directly involved with working with those partners. Um, partnerships come out of everywhere. You know, a school is constantly bombarded with people that want to help every day in many schools, but it's making sure the right partner is in the right location, making the right impact to the right students. And sometimes it does take personnel to do that and making sure that the right person's in the right place to help those partners be successful. You know, we have a lot of different variety of students across our district, being a K-12 district, as well as being just such a you know, large, you know, mass of land area that we cover so many different, you know, demographics of students. You know, the partnerships out there need to be identified and brought into the schools. You know, spe specifically some of those are just community-based need partnerships, making sure that our families that have needs at home, you know, have those opportunities to come to the school and get the resources they need to be successful at home. You know, it's not always about the educational <coughs> partnerships. Sometimes it is those community partnerships, making sure that if a student needs to find a food bag for the weekend because they're struggling, that we have those partnerships in place in some of our schools <coughs> so the students can do that and feel comfortable going and asking for those resources. And I think in addition to that, though, is looking at our, our high schools also and seeing what partnerships are out there for our high school students. I think a lot of our high school students are lacking some of the community engagement and involvement that we might see in some of the other districts and getting out there and being involved and being civically engaged in our communities in some form or another. It doesn't mean politically. It doesn't mean, you know, specifically any area, but it's being civically engaged through their church, through their community, through the school. Thank you. Ms. Pingarelli. Yes, well, we do have uh, one of the best uh, communication uh, a person here at uh, the district office, uh, Ms. Uh, Daniel Aries, um, and we do have a grant writer here. Um, uh, for me, it would be um, getting out in the community, uh, reaching out with um, not only the legislators, but um, also city council, uh, the mayor's office, um, having as much connection uh, with parents as possible. Um, uh, we do have a lot of good organizations here um, that, that are helpful, uh, but it's just try, trying to get out. And as a, as a school board member, it is kind of tough. Um, uh, most people uh, are, are uh, work 40 hours a week plus. Um, so uh, I think uh, relying a little bit on uh, our communications person uh, and our grant writer here at the district office. Thank you. And Ms. Salter. So as far as getting out for doing, um, increasing our community outreach, I think that's definitely a, a board member's, one of the board member's jobs is to make sure that the community knows about the Peoria Unified School District. And that not only takes place for district administration, but also those of us who would be on the school board. And that could be in, a, in lots of different ways. Um, partnering with, having the partnerships with different companies, uh, different community groups, but it could also be working with the Chamber of Commerce, both in Peoria and in uh, the city of Glendale. Um, it could also be very service oriented and making sure that we have volunteers from our schools out in the community because it goes both ways. It's just not what we can get from the community, but it's how we can, how we can help the community. And we have so much going on in our schools that we should be able to, 
to show that to the individuals. Once we impact those individuals, they're going to be willing to come in and volunteer in our schools. And it may not be just at our schools, it may be over in transportation, helping out in something over there. It, it, there are so many ways that we could get people um, to help our schools, and that's what we need to make those partnerships. And the last thing is, we have a whole group of people that we don't engage enough, and that's our alumni. We have so many people who have gone through these schools who appreciate being graduates of the Peoria Unified School District. Rarely do you ever hear them say, oh, I graduated from wherever. So we need to make sure we're engaging with those individuals too. Uh, thank you. All right, Dr. Gard, we start with you now. <coughs> um, one of our questioners is concerned about how Arizona has been dropping in ranking, especially in teaching things that are needed by our labor force and referred to how we teach math in order to not have gaps in the students' education, um, yeah, and wanted to know what you wanted to see the district do in order to improve instruction, um, especially, as he put it, in your, um, your foundational grades, did I, is that clear enough? Are you okay? Sort of, but Because I, I was trying to make it as clear as I could for this. That's kind of yeah, it's kind of boring. Um, so I think, uh, I think the question is kind of looking at um, our core, con core content classes um, and the teaching around those core content classes. Is that, I think that's. I would say so, and preparing for the labor force labor, that's yeah. out there, yeah. What I think that's important is that we need to look at what careers our students are going to be doing in the, you know, when our student graduates are not the same jobs that are available to them today. If you look at a kindergarten that's going into our, our Peoria schools at this time, by the time they get through our school system, the job that is going to be there for them is going to be completely different than the job that is out there today. So we are preparing them for jobs that don't even exist yet. Um, and so we need to start thinking ahead like that. And it's hard to think ahead like that because we don't know what we're preparing them for. But what we do know is that it, everything is more technology-based, more math-based, more written <coughs> communication-based. You know, it might be technology, you know, it might be written communication through technology. Um, you know, most of us never had a phone growing up and now we've had elementary school kids bringing phones to school. So I, so I think it's really a focus on identifying what is going to be important to those students and making sure that in those core grades, we are addressing those areas. You know, reading, writing, arithmetic is never going to change. But it's the format and the style that those are taught in. Our students are more collaborative than they ever were before. They are team builders. They are working together. And that is going to be the types of jobs that they're going to see in the future. It's making sure that we get those types of engagements in the classroom so they are developing those skills. It might not be the academic skills, but it's also the social emotional skills that they need in those classrooms to develop and become the next, you know, the next leaders in our job force. Thank you. Ms. Pingarelli. Uh, well, if I understand the question correctly, uh, I think the, the one of the main things would be to have um, uh, more uh, really highly qualified teachers at grades one through three. That's the really important grades. Uh, and then for the feeder schools that are coming into the high school, to have uh, um, I've noticed when I, when I first got on the board, or before I got on the board, um, just through our, our, our daughters and their friends, <coughs> kids were coming from different um, junior high schools, and they had a different math background. Um, some were, were not as proficient as others. And to improve that, to have every student coming in from all the feeder schools with particularly math background um, very solid before they get to high school. And then in, in terms of uh, jobs for the future, uh, not all kids are going to want to go to, to, to college. Um, we have a great CTE program here, and to um, really uh, um, really show the strength of the CTE program, and um, they're just such great things with, uh, with WESMAC, aviation mechanics and such. Um, students can come out making 50 plus thousand dollars a year. Um, so um, just to uh, highlight that program also. Thank you, Ms. Salter. So every day we're preparing for our next job. And whether that is the current one we have, we want to do something different, or um, changing careers. And most people change careers seven times within their lifetime. 
So we need to make sure we're exposing our students to all kinds of careers and um, ideas about what they can do for the future. Because some kids will want lots of money and some kids just want to serve others. So we need to make sure we're preparing them. We also need to make sure that our teachers know that there are workplace standards that are set down by the Department of Education and <coughs> that they need to be taught in the classroom because those workplace standards are ones that will help our students be successful in whatever career they choose or whatever line of work they go into later on. We have great programs, but we need to make sure that we're preparing our kids for the future for whatever they choose to do. Our CTE programs are great. Our fine arts programs are wonderful. Everything helps our students be prepared for the future. And we need to make sure that our teachers know we are, it's great that we're a unified school district, but a lot of times our elementary teachers know nothing about a CTE class. And so when we have those CTE days, we need to make sure that our teachers at the elementary school go up to the high school and hear about those programs. And that was one of the things that helped Frontier be successful because we were willing to do that. Thank you, Ms. Underhill. Okay, great. So um, I think I would c agree and, and support both the, the, the thought about CTE and those kinds of things. I think those are excellent. But I think we have to start further back. Um, prior to coming back to education, I was working in the early childhood field. And when our children are between the ages of zero to eight, their executive functioning skills or their skills that are going to help them be successful in careers down the road, um, being able to attune to things, to pay attention, um, are developed. And I think PUSD has done a great job of developing some really good pre-K programs um, and with support from First Things First. But we need to keep focusing on that and making sure that all children in our district have access to that, because that's where it starts. It truly does. Um, I think as far as the curriculum, I would agree that there have been some inconsistencies as far as what's being offered from school to school. And I think that we've had some transition in, in leadership and some transition in what's, you know, what is our direction. And that's where I say as a teacher, I know it would be helpful for me to work with my colleagues to make sure that what we're using as resources and curriculum, we are on board with, that it's been validated. It will also make our job a lot easier if we know that we are all working with kind of the same playbook. I'm not saying take autonomy out of the classroom, but I'm saying at least give us somewhat of a playbook that we can reach from. And then finally, I would just say we've got to continue to focus and support our CTE programs, our Met Academy, all those things that set us apart and really get our ch children prepared for the future. And that's one really important part of passing that bond. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, Ms. Pingarelli, you're going to go first this time. And it's, do you have any ideas on how to retain teachers, especially in our Title I schools? Well, um, obviously, uh, a higher pay uh, is always, um, uh, I think, is, is beneficial. Uh, but I, I do think giving teachers autonomy um, letting them teach um, the curriculum as they see fit. Um, I, I think Peoria uh, attracts a lot of uh, uh, teachers and they stay uh, because of um, the community. Um, so I think that the biggest thing is autonomy um, to the teachers. Thank you, Ms. Salter. So my job in the Glendale Elementary School District is the Wellness Program Specialist, which is something that Peoria Unified does not have. Um, we have a wellness program, but we do not have a specific person. So I believe that this would be an area that we could improve by helping our teacher. We could retain our teachers. We have a great induction program, and we have a great orientation program here. But sometimes those teachers just need a, a different phone number or somebody else to be in contact with. They need to be connected with other people so that they feel um, that culture and climate that has been so strong for Peoria. And so some of the things that we do in Glendale Elementary School District is we find them furniture. Some of them move out here and they have no furniture. They don't even have beds to live on. <clears throat> we need to um, connect them by w different activities, whether it's hiking on the weekend or whether it's going for um, um, karaoke at night, whatever that might be. 
and just making sure that they have somebody, which I was grateful to see that um, we've begun a mentoring program at each of our schools so that those individuals are mentored by somebody else um, on their campuses. We need to make those connections, just like for kids. They have to have a connection to be successful. And so we need to be doing that with our teachers as well. Thank you. Ms. Underhill. Um, I would agree with what Davida was saying as well, and I, I just think it's really critical that we look at this because we really need to have our best teachers in the areas where we need the highest growth. You know, I read some report about the irreplaceables, and those are those teachers that will be there time after time, and those are the teachers that were, are going to be the mentors for the other teachers, and they're the ones that we just can't do without. And um, I also read somewhere, and I'm not an expert on this, but there, through Title I, that there is a possibility to leverage some additional dollars or funding to sort of incentivize those teachers that will teach in those schools where we need the higher growth. So that might be something to look at. And then again, just connecting with our community-based partners um, to really help figure out how can we not just support our families, but our teachers, who are a lot of times our families, how can we bring things to them that would help support them in their job? And then finally, I know the district is working on kind of a, a broad-based behavioral intervention type assessment, and we've hired a social worker to try to kind of figure out how can we make these schools, all of our schools, you know, a more a safer place, a more healthy place for all of our students. And I think by bringing that piece on and really looking at that, we'll be supporting our teachers as well. So we just, we, we can't lose them. We got to keep these teachers and we got to create more of them in the pipeline because that's where we need them. Thank you. Dr. Gard. Um, I think something to look at beyond salaries is our benefits packages and what we have to offer the teachers. Um, not, it doesn't always come down to the money in the pocket. Sometimes it's the incentives that we're giving them beyond the money in the pocket that mean, mean the most to them. It might be you know, uh, you know, small things. It could be um, longevity through incentive by being in the district. You know, the longer they're in the district, there's, there's more incentive for them to stay in the, our salary plan within you know, Peoria. You know, there's things like that you got to look at to create the hook to get them to stay involved in the district and stay them focused. The problem you see is a lot of these teachers, like I mentioned early, earlier, are leaving Peoria. They're going to Tolleson. They might go to Phoenix Union. But then they really, in the end, they want to be back in Peoria. But by that point, they can't afford to leave those other districts to return to Peoria. But I think it's developing a salary plan, a salary package that, will, in the long term, they can see what their growth potential is and know that they can sustain themselves in Peoria and stay in Peoria and have a long-term career to be able to be a successful educator in Peoria, as well as being able to provide for their families and know that the benefits are there, the package is there, the opportunities are there for them to be successful throughout their entire career in Peoria. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Salter, you'll start the next one. And it goes on from there. As the district looks at salary increases, what would you do to help class, classified staff be part of the conversation? Well, I know there is a, a classified group that represents the classified employees, and so I would encourage individuals to make sure that they are working with that group and being involved with them. It is important for them to have a voice, so I would encourage our administrators to go out, the di directors and our um, local administrators here at the district office to go out and Make sure that they are talking with those classified employees to see what types of things um, would encourage them to stay in our district and be supportive of them so that they knew um, what items are um, helpful for them. Sometimes support staff doesn't understand their own benefits. They don't know what benefits are offered to them or the services that are offered to them in a school district because they may not have a computer that they can access on a regular basis. They may not be able to attend uh, faculty meetings. So we need to find ways to support them at their own staff, at their own um, facilities, at their own uh, schools, so that they do feel supported. And then we need to encourage them to get involved and um, make sure that they feel a part of the community. Thank you, Ms. Underhill. I would agree. I, you know, our support staff are critical, and they provide so many services to our kids that, I mean, they're just, they're amazing. And, and they don't ask for a lot, you know? But I, I, I saw them out there during the whole Red for Red thing, and they were walking along with us. And that was a huge, 
huge sacrifice for a lot of them to be out there and doing that because they believed that their family, their school, their teachers would take care of them. And, and, you know, they, and that's what I think is attractive to classified staff in Peoria is that they really, really are a part of the school family and we have to keep that. Um, I agree that there are challenges in figuring out like the employee assistance program, your health benefits. I think that would be a good service to provide to them. And just again, working, you know, working conditions. We have to make sure that we're respecting their breaks, you know, that we're giving them the time off that they need and just basically including them. And again, providing training for them to have opportunities to move on in the district if they want to. We've had several um, aides move on to want to go on and get their certification, and that's great, you know, that's what we're trying to do. So I think all those strategies would be helpful. Thank you. Dr. Gard. I think it's important to include all parties at the table when we're talking about any type of salary package. You know, we have our teachers associations, we have our classified associations. Um, and they all should be, you know, have kind of a voice of what their organizations, what their associations are looking for. Um, but another thing to remember is currently our hourly wage is increasing in the state of Arizona. You know, in the next couple of years, you're going to see the, the 2020, we're going to be at $12 an hour starting hourly, hourly wage. Um, we don't want to get to a point where our salary schedule for classified staff is, you know, is too small because <coughs> our, our, our entry level is at $12 an hour, but we're paying our top end you know, classified staff so low. We need to make sure we develop a salary schedule for our classified staff that continues to support the growth through our system. So once our classified employees are in the district, they are continuing to want to grow in those positions. You don't want somebody to come in at the bottom at $12 an hour and be like, my growth potential, my earning potential in Peoria just isn't there because the salary schedule for classified staff is so compressed. We need to get that compression out of the classified salary schedule so there is reason for our classified staff to go back to school or to participate in our district's professional growth so that way they can continue to move through those salary schedules. Um, a lot of the time, our classified staff members don't even understand the opportunities for professional growth. And that professional growth adds up real quick for a classified staff member because it's going to directly impact their hourly wage. Mm -hmm. And that hourly wage increasing is going to directly impact their paycheck going home. And many of our classified staff members in any district are sitting there not taking advantage of professional growth. So I think it's getting out there, advertising those opportunities, helping them understand those opportunities, because that is increasing the earning potential. Even if they come in at the bottom at $12 an hour, they're going to have the opportunity to increase their earning potential by going through, you know, with professional growth and continuing through that. Thank you. Ms. Pingarelli. Uh, well, uh, uh, last year we had given the, um, uh, the certified uh, teachers uh, a 10 plus uh, percent raise. Um, the, uh, we've increased the um, salary for bus drivers also. Um, I think that uh, this year uh, we do need to focus on the classified. Um, and however, however we can, dollars are, are scarce and uh, it's difficult. You have to take, potentially take from one thing to give to the other, but I think the classified really does need uh, a, a bump. Uh, and I've heard that from people in our district also. Um, I just got an email, I think continuing education, uh, classified uh, is getting, I think, five cents an hour per, per credit. So up to 75 cents an hour starting uh, for the 2018-19 um, um, year. So uh, that's one way through continuing education to get uh, a salary increase every year. Uh, but I think the board does need to focus on classified this year. Thank you. We're getting close to running out of time here. I have two questions left, and I thought I'd try to combine them and start with Ms. Underhill. Um, what are your thoughts on reducing maximum classified? Oh, do, 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 do. no. Um, what do you call it? Oh, yeah. The maximum class size. Uh, for instance, 30 second graders before an additional teacher is brought in. You know, what are your opinions there? And the other one had to do with um, things like cameras in the school, uh, you know, and then plans for space center location. Uh, would money from the bond be applied for that, or do they have to allocate funds for specific things, I don't know how much you know about this, but, you know, please, you know, the person is interested in what supports and protections are going to be in the classroom. Okay. I might have to jump back and 
ask, but yeah. okay. um, as far as class size, I think it would be wonderful if we could cap our, you know, primary grades at, you know, under 25. I mean, it's just, it's so difficult when we have little guys that, you know, have barely sat in a chair that are coming in and we have these ginormous class sizes. I know it's a battle, though, because we want to raise teachers' salaries, and if we raise teachers' salaries, oftentimes we have to consider class size. So I know it's a challenge. It's something that we definitely need to work on. And we just got to keep trudging ahead as a state and as a district to do whatever we can to increase, you know, investment in education so that we can make that happen. But absolutely, smaller class size makes a lot of difference. I've had a class of 23 and I've had a class of 30 and it's a big, huge difference, you know. Um, as far as I think you're talking about I safety think and security. I figured it out. Okay. okay. Um, they're asking about cameras in the school. Okay as a separate thing. And then the other one is the plan for the space center location. And is money for that going to be allocated in the bond? OK. Um, the Challenger Center, there's yes. not dollars for that in the bond. OK. No. Um, there's a lot of different thoughts about what to do with that. And I think the district is going to come up with something pretty creative and you know, potentially Maybe, if we're clever, we can come up with something that produces some income. We don't know. <laughs> but um, as far as the bond, no. Um, and then as far as cameras in the schools, um, this may have come up in the strategic planning session around safety and security. Um, I know that we do have cameras in this high school, or at least the high schools at this point, and they are only in the hallways. And in, dis in discussing that with a couple of different principals, a couple of different thoughts. One is that we need to have wider spread cameras because when we have those urgent situations that we don't like to talk about but do happen, we need to make sure that we can you know, access all aspects of the school. And the second idea that, um, that I've talked about with a couple of different people around that strategic planning forum was about um, our police department, um, since we have such good relationships with our cities, being able to access those cameras, um, because currently they're only accessible on site by a certain number of folks um, that can access the terminal. So if we have a situation, it'd be great if our police force could actually access that off site. So I'm not sure I'm answering all those questions, but I there's a little bit. <laughs> I think you did. Okay, okay. Dr. Gard. Um, I think you know, class size is always a hot topic, but uh, just like was mentioned, um, class size and salaries are going to go hand in hand. Um, you're going to do the best you can to bring the class sizes down while still being competitive with your salaries. So it's, it's going to be a back and forth, a give and take, and I think that's where you work with your employee association groups to see what, what is acceptable, um, what do the teachers feel is acceptable in their classroom while still being able to staff the schools and provide adequate salaries for our staff. Um, so it's a little bit of a give and take that you've you got to work with there. Um, the Challenger Center, like uh, was mentioned, I know there's not money in the bond, but I do believe the district has some great ideas moving forward to take advantage of the Challenger Center and turn it into a positive. Um, school safety, I think, is where the cameras is going. Um, school safety is the biggest hot topic item I think there is in the public eye today. Um, you got to find that, that magic line where the, you determine the school safety is positive, but you don't want to create the school into an environment where the students feel like they're in a prison. Or that when you walk in the front door as a community member or as a parent, you feel like you're walking into a bank that's like locked down and you can't get it anywhere. <laughs> so there's that magic feeling that you've got to develop and the district really has to work with um, architects. They've got to work with, you know, do studies and understand what is the best plan to develop a safe school, a safe environment for our students while still making it a comfortable environment for our employees, a comfortable mm -hmm. environment for our community members and our parents when they're entering the schools. Um, I'm in the middle of a remodel on my campus right now, and one of our important things was to make sure that our front office, when the students and parents walk in, doesn't feel like they're locked down and that they're, they're criminals on their own. Um, we've all been into those banks that have the three-inch thick bulletproof glass. You don't want that in our schools. It doesn't feel safe. It feels intrusive. It feels like something is going to happen. You know, you're implying that something is going to happen by going that far. Now, am I saying that there aren't barriers that should be put in place? No. I'm saying that there, there's different levels of glass, there's different levels of security that you can put into place in these front offices, into these schools, to still make it feel like a safe environment to everybody involved, but also providing an environment that does prevent an intruder, does prevent somebody from the outside. One thing we do need to remember is <coughs> if you look at these school incidents that have happened in the last 10 years, 90% of them, 95% of them happen internally. It's not somebody coming in from the outside, it's somebody that's already on the campus. So it's, it's about training some of that. It's about letting your school staff, you know, your security on your campuses, your administrators, your teachers, your classified staff, understand what to look for. Making sure they have that behavioral training. Making sure that your counselors, your behavior teams, understand what to look for in students 
so that way they can be prepared and prevent what's going to happen before it ever happens because it's a lot of times it's going to happen from the inside and it's hard to prevent what's going to stop what's going to happen on the inside when they're already on the inside without prior being involved mm -hmm. thank you miss pingarelli okay on the first one class size um, obviously it is optimal to have a, a smaller class size um, that is why i had mentioned um, I, I have mentioned for the past couple of years on out-of-district students. Um, it's great to accept out-of-district students when um, we are not at or over capacity. Uh, when we are over capacity, not to uh, bring in more out-of-district students uh, because that does increase the class size, um, that it, it decreases the learning environment for the students that we have here in the district. Um, so let's see, on the other one, uh, cameras in the school. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a balance between privacy and, and safety. Um, you know, I believe that there, there, there should be, uh, um, you know, cameras within the, the, the school. Uh, right now, um, our administration is going, um, they're focusing on safety. Uh, they've gone to uh, a couple of different um, uh, out-of-state um, uh, gatherings that, that, that they brought back information or they will be bringing back information uh, so I think there's there's a there's a, a, a you know a fine line between privacy and safety I fall on the, the line of safety um, uh, with the X Challenger Center um, I believe there is a uh, a, a, a certain percentage uh, that the superintendent has a, uh, a leeway with uh, I don't remember offhand what that is um, but the board, it is uh, agendized to, or will be agendized to look at the uh, X Challenger Center after the bond to see if the bond passes or not. Thank you. And finally, Ms. Salter. And so uh, verse, class size always impacts uh, salary. But I also think we need to look at the type of students we have in our individual schools. Because a class size, um, a maximum class size in one of our schools may be totally different than a maximum class size in a different school, depending on the needs of those individual students. So we, we need to look across the district to make sure that we're filling the needs of each of those students and the teachers that are in those classrooms. And it's definitely going to impact um, the salaries, but we can also look at ways to support those teachers who may have larger class sizes. And um, that may be with an aid or it may be a, a, um, a grade level aid, whatever that might be. Um, Challenger Center, I think if, uh, I know that the administration is looking at ways to use the Challenger Center. I am grateful that it's not something that's gone by the wayside, having had um, many activities in there. And I do believe, I agree with Corey, hopefully it'll be something that we can um, gain some money back from. It could be used for lots of different, different activities. Uh, so I, if, if the administration doesn't have something, which I'm sure they might have something in place, let's have a task force of teachers and community members so that they can give input. That has been helpful in the past. And then finally, cameras in the school. Um, that's, it depends, again, we need to look at each individual school and the ideas need to come from within as well as the community. And so cameras in the school can be uh, something for safety, but, that, but a school might need a school resource officer instead. So we need to look at individual schools, work with those communities, meaning the staff and the, the families there, and determine what's best for each of the schools. Thank you. I must say, if I were voting, I'd have a hard time of it. You're all excellent and really appreciate your coming out and educating this group as well as you have. And I urge everyone here to vote. Uh, you've got a big decision to make in a lot of different areas, and please exercise your vote. There's nothing more important. Also, there are other questions, I am sure, and <coughs> I'd like to ask um, you to come forward and explain how, if people wish to have other questions asked, they can, and also thank you all for coming.
Thank you so much, Lois. Uh, you did a wonderful job. I appreciate the League of Women Voters and uh, your charter and your goals uh, coming out to help us. And I'd like to thank our panel. You did a fabulous job. I know it's nerve wracking. I'd like to apologize. I got nervous when I got up here and did my original spiel. I neglected to say we have some uh, current school board members that help, uh, were also attending. Uh, I'm going to go row by row. I see Kathy Connect in the front row. <laughs> I see Monica Sejar Martinez in the second row, along with David Sandoval, along with Mrs. Pingarelli. So we appreciate that their support, knowing it was probably a little bit more fun being on that side <laughs> than being up in front. Um, and then, uh, I, if I missed anyone, there is our superintendent, Mrs. Linda Palace Thompson. Thank you so much for seeing. <coughs> and what's going to happen if there were additional questions that were not answered? We're going to take those questions, provide them to all four candidates, and give them the opportunity re to respond, and then we will uh, have that posted on our Pe Peoria United Parent Council site. In addition, tonight's event was recorded. We will have a link, give us a day or two to get it retrieved from the big black box up there. And we will also link that from our Peoria United Parent Council site, which is uh, P-U-P-C. Peoriaupc.org. Thank you. <laughs> Peoriaupc.org. You think I would know. Um, <laughs> So again, thank you all for attending. It was much appreciated. Thank you, panel, that you did a great job. <laughs>